The draft got so nuts at pick number eight. The Atlanta Falcons going with the lefty out of Washington, a quarterback, Michael Penix Jr. Now, he did not attend the draft, but he did address the media and, like all of us, a little bit surprised. The moment was special, you know, obviously it's something I've been dreaming of since I was a kid, you know, so to be able to be in this position, you know, I'm blessed, you know, and uh, that, that's all I can say, I'm blessed, you know, I, I mean, I had no idea, you know, but I know that, you know, uh, everything happens for a reason. I'm super excited to be able to be a part of the, the organization and I, I can't wait to go make an impact. <laughs> Sunglasses inside and an impact shaking up this draft at number eight. Peter, what do you make of it? Yeah, look, this is the pick of the night. If you're if you're just waking up this morning, Penix, nobody had in the top 10 in any mock drafts. Penix, nobody had tied to Atlanta. Then yesterday, late afternoon, you started hearing some whispers of other teams wondering, is there a surprise team in the top 10? Is there a team that would trade up in the top 10 for one of the quarterbacks as each one of these teams were figuring out who was going to be their match? So the Atlanta Falcons, the same offseason they give Kirk Cousins over $100 million, end up <laughs> drafting a quarterback, and a quarterback who's not a project quarterback. This wasn't like them taking some wild-card quarterback who they're like, he needs three years. To... Michael Penix has been playing college football for about a decade. He's 24 years old. He's one of the best quarterbacks over the last four seasons of college football. This, this is one of those deals where you try to justify it, and here is the argument that will be made out of Atlanta. Make the argument. Go on. The argument is you look at Green Bay and the reaction when they took Jordan Love, and yes, Jordan Love was 21 years old, and yes, uh, Aaron Rodgers, there was no threat of him at all, and, and of course Aaron Rodgers was 13-3. and three. These guys were the eighth overall pick. You look at Green Bay. They drafted their guy, Jordan Love, and there was eventually a transition to be made. In this case, if you're Atlanta, you make this move for Cousins. You think you're going to the playoffs. You think you're winning the NFC South. You envision yourself to be in the back end of the first round for the next several years. You won't get an opportunity to draft a quarterback. You won't be able to draft a guy like Michael Penix. And as you saw the last few years, when they're bouncing around, in medioc mediocrity and season after season of eight and eight and nine and seven and getting Ritter and Heineke and just very little star blue chip quarterbacks. They ended up having to pay $100 million for one. This is their insurance policy. They get a guy that they think is a number one quarterback, but he is now going to be their number two. Kirk Cousins not being told it was going to happen. I don't know if you're being paid $100 million necessarily if I'm going to cry for you the next morning that there's a little competition in the quarterback room. They'll have conversations with everybody. I wouldn't have said this was going to happen. I certainly am not one to be like, it was a great pick. I hear you at home. That's the justification. They now have their succession plan in place. Kirk Cousins is 36 years old, coming off an Achilles injury. God forbid he goes down. We still have a guy, and we still have a team built to win. It's very well stated, Peter. I need to retort with the other side of things. Yeah, There's sure. a lot of fans here last night, and nobody's crying for Kirk Cousins, but I'm looking for answers for Falcons fans who are waking up this morning with the same question that fans all across the world have. is like, what are we doing? Like, that's just a simple question. So naturally, you cut to the Falcons' brain trust. You just mentioned it, and they go right to it. We're doing the Jordan Love formula. There's a few slight, really key differences between the Atlanta Falcons and the Green Bay Packers. The Jordan Love formula, which worked for the Packers, the year prior to drafting Jordan Love, they were a 13-win team. The year after drafting Jordan Love, they're a 13-win team. This was already a juggernaut that was in the playoffs, winning playoff games every single year. The Atlanta Falcons doing the Jordan Love family haven't been to the playoffs, Peter, in seven years. So we have no turnkey playoff team that we're just going to have the luxury of stashing some quarterback for a few years. We need players. We haven't been to the playoffs since post-28-3. to Like, it's been a long time. So I think there's other teams that are going to do this because the Packers did it, seemed to work well. So we'll draft the quarterback now. I think the Cowboys should have done it last night, and they didn't. But if you're a Falcons fan, you're saying, Kirk Cousins is not Aaron Rodgers. We're not the Packers. We're trying to win in, in Andy's room against the Jaguars. Like, never mind getting to the <laughs> NFC title game and all these assumptions that we're going to be in the playoffs every because we have Kirk Cousins. Yeah. No one in the media loves Kirk Cousins more than me. Guys, he ain't no lock. No, He's not going to turn the Falcons in, into some sort of uh, greatest show on turf. So if you're a Falcons fan this morning, you're like, okay, great. I guess we have a long-term solution at quarterback. What is the 2024 team? Can I tell you the dichotomy? And maybe Jason will hit this, too, as someone who lived in one of those buildings. 
You got Belichick on over on YouTube and ESPN Plus. At this is all going down, and here's Belichick who they passed on, and here's Belichick yeah. with Indra. And like, we trust this 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 organ. We're going to trust our brain trust in Rich McKay and Terry Fontenot and Arthur Blank and now Raheem Moore. And it's not like they just went chalk and said, "All right, Dallas Turner or Terry on Arnold." They take this huge swing, and if it doesn't work, it's almost more ammo for the Belichick camp being like, "Okay, you guys know better." Mm-hmm. What do you think, Jack? That's a great point, and Bill was on there, and the one thing he said was having two good quarterbacks can never be a bad thing. But as I look at this, Kyle, I'm right with you because you're sitting there and you're saying, all right, we're bringing in Michael Penix. You're uh, you're copying the Green Bay style, and something that you just said, Shregs, was Penix is three years older than Jordan Love was when he got drafted. So by the time he gets on the field, it's a totally different situation. I'm looking at this, and as much as Atlanta loved Kirk Cousins, Kirk Cousins coming in there doesn't guarantee that we're now winning a Super Bowl. So now you start to wonder, you draft Michael Penix, eighth overall. At what point does he play? Does he play after year one? Is he inserted if something goes wrong? Do they feel confident to be able to put him in the game before we maybe anticipate it? And on the flip side for Kirk Cousins and his camp, hearing about it when they get on the clock is crazy. And that's something that he said. This is a business. You got to deal with it. You can be frustrated. And 100 million, all of those different things, feelings are feelings you got to go out there and perform. It's like at the same time, you guys are out in Detroit. You go out, you're at the bar. And next thing you know, you call your wife back home. And you're like, hey, I met a young lady. I want to move in with us and be my second girlfriend or something like that. That's what Kirk Cousins was dealing with last night. And you got to pick your stuff up, go out there and perform. But for a Falcons team that looked like, all right, we got Kirk Cousins. We felt like we were a quarterback away. And now we got to build our team around him to go get Michael Penix this high, this early, and worry about the future. You can question what they're doing right now now but I look at this as from a long-term standpoint the Falcons are saying hey as much as we like Kirk Cousins as a veteran on our team and our organization and what he's going to be able to do for our team over the next year to maybe two we feel like Michael Penix is a guy that can take us over the top Kirk Cousins throughout his career has been really good but hasn't been able to get to that promised land of getting to a Super Bowl they may feel that way about Michael Penix Jane you were talking about Kirk Cousins and his reaction to his camp what would you make of it Well, when I reached out to his camp, as I reported last night, they were given no indication of this. I know some people said they picked up the phone right as they were calling, but doesn't seem like uh, a lot of a heads up. And I think there is some frustration here. Yes, I think it's hard for a lot of fans to go, well, why should we cry over a guy that's getting, you know, 90 million guaranteed the first two years, 10 million guaranteed the third year. But as it was explained to me, We have a no trade clause, not a must trade clause at this point. So I do think that they're going to have to smooth things over a little bit. There was an understanding that if they were going to get a quarterback, that they would reach out and give them a heads up. That didn't happen. So before we go after the Falcons, before we go after Terry Fontenot, why don't we at least hear what he had to say in terms of explaining himself for the pick? If you believe in a quarterback, you have to take him. And if he sits for four or five years, that's, that's, that's a great problem to have because, because we're, we're doing so well at that position. So it's, it's just as, as simple as if, if you see a guy that you believe in at that position, you have to take him. I just I think the hard part I'm having with this, Peter, is when did you fall in love with Michael Penix? I mean, we all know that mm-hmm. they went to Seattle. They brought their contingency up there. They had the workout. But when he's sitting there saying you're OK with them sitting four to five years are they trying to convince themselves that when the market becomes overbloated in a couple of years for quarterbacks, APYs, and guarantees, they can say, well, your number doesn't match that because you haven't played a lot, and maybe they're saying that they're going to get a bargain in the future? I'm just confused. Maybe you can help me make sense of it, Peter. That's a, Look, that's the economics of the NFL. If you were to ask a, you know, a Yale graduate in analytics, they would tell you draft a quarterback every year because you never want to hit these points where you're paying Tua Tunga Vailoa $55 million or Derek Carr $50 million. You just keep having a different stash of young guys so that when you're done with Cousins, you've got someone else at a relatively normal price and an affordable price and you could build around them. Truth of the matter is this. The quarterback is valued differently than every other position in the league. If you love a quarterback, you can justify in your head, we're taking him whether we have one or not. Like you said, uh, they, 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 they obviously aren't a quarterback away from winning a Super Bowl. But also in the same breath, are they a, a Dallas Turner or a Latu away from winning the Super Bowl? In this case, they value the quarterback position. They have been through hell since Matt Ryan you know, <laughs> has been gone. We're talking about terrible quarterback play and a rotating door. That's real. That leaves scars. And now 
I, you can't platoon them. And, and that's the other thing. When they had Flacco in Baltimore and they drafted Lamar, the yeah. argument was, well, you'll get Lamar in on some gadget plays. You'll figure it out. You'll get him involved. Penix, this is not that. Penix no. isn't that quarterback. Right. Now, you could use him in the run game, but he's more of a pocket quarterback also. It may, I, I see that some Falcons fans this morning are saying, well, if we like Penix that much, why don't we just draft Penix and not buy, buy, not buy Cousins? Like, let's just go with him. We, they must absolutely be head over heels for Penix. So bring him in and start him like all the other rookies are going to start. Why not? But... It's not the case. I, I have to hear, when I when I hear them say, sit for four, four or five, five years. years. <laughs> so what, Michael Penix's first start is going to be against an arch man, and he's going to be thirty. Yeah, he's what are we doing? Already? It's five years. I, what we, that's nuts. And I know it's the new normal now, but again, you, due respect, like you're the Falcons. Like you need to get off the off your butt. You need some weapons. You need some people. And he's going to be sitting there, Peter, until 2029. It'll be the next eclipse, and he already has the glasses. Like what? That, it was a, it's a very strange pick. I'm confused this morning. The Belichick army is out, I'll tell you that. that when you're a brain trust and you make such an outside-the-box pick, yeah. and there's an article last week that comes out and says Belichick wasn't in your top three of coaching decisions, yeah. and this, <laughs> you're, this is going against convention. This is saying we're really going against convention and just – the typical chalk. Here's what it is. There are some happy teams this morning. We're going to talk about them, right? We're going to talk some We're happy not just players. Going to talk yeah. Right? No, it's not. Yeah. Is that, Daniel Jones is happy this morning, right? <laughs> is, yeah. Let's go, Daniel. All right, take us out. We'll be.